Welcome to the Triangle Association of Freelancers August meeting. I'm Rita Lewis, and I'll be your Zoom host tonight. I'd like to introduce Karen Weiberg, our meeting facilitator, who will introduce and interview our guest speaker, Chris Spazak. Karen is the owner of ClearSight Books, where she helps business leaders write nonfiction books. She's a ghostwriter, editor, and coach who helps her clients develop a clear message and a compelling voice. Welcome, Karen. Good evening, happy to be here. And I'm super excited to introduce Chris Fizak. Chris will be a familiar face to many of you. She was a speaker at our 2019 Right Now conference with her talk, Seeking Grammartopia. You may have picked up a copy of her book, Get a Grip on Your Grammar. I should have grabbed it from my bookshelf. It's behind me. <laughs> her latest book, which I do have here, is the novel editing workbook, 105 Tricks and Tips for Revising Your Fiction Manuscript. Now available. <laughs> I had the pleasure of reading it this week and of getting many good reminders. So if you're a fiction writer, this workbook has a lot of handy exercises and tips that can really help you level up your manuscript. Chris has taught at the University of Richmond and at Virginia Commonwealth University. She's an active speaker. We were just hearing about a, a podcast she was a guest on with um, Joanna Penn recently. That's awesome. She leads workshops and she is a freelance editor. She's also a member of several writers associations and is the board chair of the nonprofit James River Writers. So welcome, Chris. So Thank happy you, so you much, could Cara. zoom in from Virginia. I know. This is pretty wonderful, the world that we live in. That Hello from Virginia, everyone. Yeah, yeah. So tonight, I'm, I'm excited to talk about editing. I kind of geek out on it sometimes. <laughs> exactly. And I, you know, Chris and I kind of hit it off when she was here for the conference because she kind of geeks out on it too. <laughs> so, you know, kindred spirits. So we're talking about editing. And to be more specific, we're going to talk about self-editing, the writer's essential tool. Now, Chris, I have noticed that writers can be incredibly sloppy when we're talking about editing and the different types of editing and what it means. So how about we start with you in your words. Tell us when you think about editing and self-editing. What is that? I love that you asked that question to start off because it's kind of one of those terms that kind of needs some revision, which is really ironic because editing in so many people's minds, you think of, oh, okay, that's grammar. That's punctuation and spelling and typos. But editing is so much bigger than that. And especially when you're talking about self-revising your own work, no matter what you write, whether you're a poet or a novelist or a journalist or just really love typing on social media, everybody needs to edit not just those typos, but I like to break editing down into kind of three levels of editing. And I'm not gonna say this in terms of, as a professional editor, these are the levels that I offer. This is just the general levels that everybody should think of when they think of editing. I like to think of, first, you have the macro edit. This is the big picture edit. You're thinking about structure. You're thinking about voice. You're thinking about, are you really pulling off those characters that exist or that subject matter or that theme? All those really big ideas. And after that, you need to go to the micro editing, which is sentence level, but it's still not quite that third level, which is that proofreading, or that proofreading is that final dot every I, cross every T moment. But that copy editing, excuse me, or that micro editing in the middle, is really getting into empowering your word choice, empowering every paragraph, empowering every sentence. So often when people finish, they hit the end, they celebrate whatever they're working on, maybe they grab a drink, a couple of you guys I saw had some drinks here, but you don't just then go to page one, sentence one, and start reading for grammar. You then look at the big picture, what's working for the whole, because it's kind of a waste of everybody's time if you jump into editing grammar, if you haven't even thought of, is this article even working? Is it thematic? Is it structured in a place where the reader can enter into it? No matter what you write, you have to look at big picture edits before you think about the grammar and the typos. And I think that's where everyone thinks about when they think, oh, editor, but there's so much more to that. And that's interesting because when I describe 
when I describe writing phases to people, I start with, you know, you have ideation and then you draft and then you revise. So I think you're talking a little bit, the macro editing is, is revision in a right. sense and then editing, whatever you want to label it, and then proofreading, you know, working that big to small. Yeah. So, yeah, that is so important. And when you say self-editing, it's just editing for yourself. Exactly. Other than others. Exactly. So often people have the idea that once you finish a piece and you're so proud of yourself and if you can just send it off to the world because there are editors who will take care of the rest. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> if you want to be serious in this industry, again, no matter whether you're indie publishing, traditional publishing, magazines, playwrights, poets, whatever you're doing, you need to take time with your words. Because if you don't take time with your words and polish them to that shine, nobody else is gonna really take you seriously. And that's, I think that's my message that I just preach to everyone because this is a super competitive world that we live in in the writing world. It's amazing because anyone, anyone can write. We all have the tools. All you need is a pen and some paper, maybe a word processor to get it all out. Anyone can do this. But if you wanna do it well, if you wanna be successfully published, even if you're publishing yourself, if you want people to buy your work, you need to take the time with it. Yeah, and that's interesting. I often get people who come to me in nonfiction with a first draft. It is quite rough. <laughs> and, you know, it's spelling it all out on the page and they think they're done. Now, a lot of the people I work with are not, they're not writers as their primary gig. So they don't always understand. They haven't taken creative writing classes. They don't always know what goes into it. And sometimes they just don't want to do that, do that revision work before engaging an editor. Um, but that I, is just that re-seeing is so important to make sure you are achieving your goals with your story that you're telling. Exactly. And I think yeah. that idea of process of not knowing where to start, that is where my most recent yeah. book was born is what are the steps? How can I go one, two, three, and actually revise, edit, proofread my book? Because Editing is this scary term. We know we have to do it, but then we're imagining red pens and people yelling at us and failing our sonar tests. I mean, I will note there's a red pen on the cover of the book. <laughs> we actually had a big debate about that, which was the funny thing. It's like, do we do it? Is that too bold? But a red pen on the cover? But um, yeah, I just need to break it down because editing, this is honestly the most empowering part of the process. I mean, for me, everybody has their most favorite parts. I think like, Karen and I, we might agree yeah. on this piece. Yeah. This is really where you take your project and your vision and your dream of that thing that you could have written and you make it really that idea you once had. Yeah. This is the polish. Yeah. So, so when I get those clients who need help on revision, I'm usually working in nonfiction, so I can actually help them shape their ideas. That's totally different from fiction. I can't help you figure out what your story is. I mean, right. I can ask you questions to get there, but how do you go about helping people I with think your fiction? You, yeah. Right, and I think you nailed it. It's a matter of questions because editor is not a ghostwriter. I mean, that's a different hat that many of us wear, but editing, editing is not me taking your manuscript and write, rewriting it for you to make it be what it needs to be. And again, that's a big distinction for folks to know. But if you are working on something and someone's not quite there, there's the essence of something amazing on the page. That's where the questions come in is what is the problem of the story? What is the narrative drive that that character wants that is going to take them from page one to the very end? What are they afraid of? Where, um, kind of, what is the, it, what is it that you as the writer want to have the reader close the book and have left in their head? What is it that is pushing that person, motivating that person? Where is it that you might be really excited about a scene, but what does that scene right there have anything to do with the rest of your plot? It might have been really fun to write, but does it actually fit with the whole? We look at pacing, all of those big issues, but I think you nailed it that starting with questions is really the best way to start with an edit. And even when you're editing yourself, just ask yourself the hard questions like that. Uh, let me ask you, one of the things you do when you're assessing the big picture of any story is one what the you and service you provide is critiquing fiction manuscripts. Mm -hmm. How do you go about starting that process? How do you think about that? I like to think about everybody needs to have a reader outside of themselves um, in that piece of it because you as a writer 
know what you want to say. You can envision that character. You can envision everything about your story. But sometimes what's in your head does not necessarily translate down your neck, out your shoulders, down your arms, to the keyboard when you're typing. And when you yourself are reading, you know how brilliant this scene is. You know how captivating it is. But a reader who is not actually attached to your brain might not be making the same connections. Where you're seeing this profound scene, it might be falling absolutely flat. Or this character, maybe it's not something that the reader is empathizing with at all. Or your hook, where you think there's this moment in the beginning that will pull a reader from page one all the way. If that hook isn't really grabbing anybody, you might not realize it because you were so darn excited about your own project. And that's kind of where that manuscript critique comes in. That's that big level. This is where I'm going to ask lots of questions. And it's kind of that line between a uh, beta reader review and a developmental edit. I kind of produce off of that kind of a 10-page single-space New York publisher style critique where I'm just going to ask a whole bunch of questions and nitpick over a whole bunch of the details saying, you know what, I hear what you're going for. Here's a place that's brilliant. This right here, use this moment as an example for this over, other moment over here, where you seem to be trying to do the same thing, but it's not quite pulling off here. So it's really that dive into all those big structure, character, pacing elements. So let's talk about some of those, those elements just a little bit. Um, structure is always fascinating to me. In nonfiction, there, there could be so many different types of structures that are very chronological or principle-based or how-to steps. So structure kind of becomes a little more obvious. To me, to me, uh, sort of a novice fiction writer, <laughs> I have a harder time with fiction structure and understanding myself as a writer what, what I need to be looking for. Do you have a particular formula you use or the classical story structure? What do you do? What do you look I, for? I love that you said that you were intimidated that direction because I actually have the other issue that I feel like with nonfiction so often there is probably a right way or a, some guidance that this, the subject matter is going to kind of guide how you put it together. Mm -hmm. And it's very limiting for someone who's attached to fiction. Because <laughs> in fiction, as you said, you can do anything, but yes. you have to do it well and actually pull off what you're achieving, trying to achieve. So in terms of structure, I like to look at kind of two different um, theories, one being the hero's journey. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the hero's journey, that at some point in the very beginning of your story, the hero is on a quest of some sort. The hero wants something. And of course, this does not necessarily need to, necessarily need to be Odysseus who is questing across the sea and going through all of these things. It could be a quest that's internal. It can be an a quest that's external. It could be so many different things. But through the course of the story, that quest needs to be clear in the very, very beginning. And through the course of the story, there needs to be stumbling blocks. There needs to be achievement. You're getting closer. Oh, and then you fall. And then there needs to be kind of this climax that grows and grows and grows until you achieve it. And it's this wonderful cycle of the hero's journey that you can uh, look up. And I'm happy to share resources afterwards. Just yeah. talk about how to build it. If you just think of terms of your protagonist is the hero of your story and they are up against all odds to achieve whatever it is. And whether you're writing romance or historical fiction or fantasy or anything, this hero's journey model works incredibly well for fiction. Um, the second model I like to refer to is just the simple three act structure. Think Shakespeare. Think about how you need to set the stakes for your story. What is it that a reader needs to know in the very beginning? How does it get more, more and more complex? You're going to notice how these two structures are pretty much overlapping. And then how do you find that answer in Act 3 that kind of resolves it all together? Two different ways to look at kind of the same idea, but structure should not be nearly as intimidating as it is for a lot of people. And I love that I'm getting to talk to a yeah. nonfiction editor and writer about this because you have completely two different worlds on this. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can see the hero's journey and I can see the three acts. And yet somehow when I try to do it myself, it just sort of falls apart. So uh, I was watching the original Star Wars this weekend, which is a perfect example of the journey of the heroes. So that was, I was, I was, waxing on about it to my husband so that's awesome you know, that. speaking of movies you know what movie i absolutely love to talk about in terms of editing both in terms of the hero's journey and also in terms of connecting your reader with the protagonist 
um, The Hunger Games. And I just said movie, oh, yeah. book. I should start with yeah. books since I am talking with a whole bunch of writers. But in The Hunger Games, you have this character who's inherently unlikable. I mean, Katniss is not really nice. She's incredibly rough. But in the very beginning of that story, what does Katniss do? She offers her own self up to save her sister. And in that moment, this incredibly unlikable character is completely won over by the readers. So no matter who your character is, how can you, in that first scene, find a way to get your reader to empathize and connect and be wowed by some little morsel of good, some little act to hook them? And then Katniss does go on this hero's journey through the course of that. So that's an interesting point. That raises something in your book that caught my eye. And as a newer fiction writer, it really resonated and made me think. Um, you talk about, on page 34, uh, characters having agency and being able to make choices and decisions to move the story forward rather than things just happening and you and you talk about that later on talking about you know oh they suddenly realized <laughs> you know without a trigger for that realization right. so that to me was a really fascinating thing can you talk about that a little bit and how does that fit into the plot like absolutely how do those fit together Absolutely. Now, of course, when we're talking about agency, people hear that words and we're all writers. Many of us are looking for things in our publishing journey and you're thinking agency and you're literary <laughs> agency and you're getting all excited. It's not what we're talking about. The whole idea of agency is, is your character an active player in their own story? And that's something that's sometimes hard because sometimes you have this character in your head and things start happening to him or her and all of a sudden, this terrible thing happens, and this terrible thing happens, and suddenly your character is reactive. They're passive in their own story, and they're just only dealing with all of these external forces that are being thrown at them. And that's kind of this everyman character that we aren't really getting to know that character. We're not really attaching to that character. We're cheering them on, maybe, but we're not necessarily connecting as well as we could if that character makes actions on their own. And sometimes maybe those actions save the day. And sometimes maybe those actions are their own downfall or something terrible happens because of a bad choice they make. But characters need to actually do, not just have the external world happen around them. Because you're right, if everything just happens around them and they're just kind of walking through their day, that's not really that compelling of a read. We're not getting attached to that person and cheering them on as much as we would if we're actually seeing them make choices. And again, right and wrong, it goes back to other things about characters is sometimes we have this person in our head, characters should not be perfect. Sometimes we write. I was just going to ask you yeah. about that to say, yeah. you got to have a little gray in there, some good decisions and bad decisions. So talk exactly. about that a little bit more. Exactly. I'm just rambling. Goodness. <laughs> so it's a whole idea of if characters are perfect and they always make good idea, good decisions, and they're brilliant, and they're beautiful, and they're adventurous, and they're brave, and they always make the right choice to save the day. I mean, that's not necessarily an action hero I would get excited about. That's not, even in romance, that perfect individual should not be perfect because it's not interesting. It's kind of dull. Nobody wants the happily ever after without a little bit of struggle because that's a story that we can sink our teeth into that we can relate to because we aren't perfect, neither should characters be. They need to be relatable. And if we're writing perfect all the time, perfect circumstances, perfect characters, perfect antagonists who get away with it every single time, everyone needs to have flaws. In life, people do, our characters do too. One thing I was trying to explain to a, a client recently was related to what you were just saying about agency and uh, the tension that, ha that needs to come in to create an interesting story about making a critical decision with perhaps competing values. Um, Luke Skywalker again comes to mind. Should he go save Luke? Should he go save Han and Leia or finish studies with Yoda? <laughs> you know, so tough decision to make, neither one necessarily wrong, but leads down a different path. Um, oh, where was I going? I was going to ask you to talk about something with agency and tension in there um how and do those you those are the most beautiful yeah. moments Absolutely. yeah 
Yeah. How do you go about helping people create more complex characters and complex plot? That's a good question too. It is one of those moments where smooth sailing is not always what you want in your book. Go back to that hero's journey concept. You want to start with a problem and you want to have moments where there are successes, but there have to be bumps in the road. And some of them have to be big bumps because if there aren't, if this is a perfect story of someone wants to find their long lost grandmother and they're going through all of these things and they get clues, 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 find her. Well, I mean, we weren't necessarily as hooked on that story as we could have been if there were false leads, if there were wrong turns, if there were bad guys. I mean, all these catch terms, but an interesting story is interesting because it's dynamic, because it's complex and writers don't, shouldn't cheat to just get to that happy ending. We need to kind of give ourselves our own little challenges along the way saying, okay, you need to get from A to B. Here's this easy way. Is my character gonna discover that easy way? Maybe. Is my character going to realize there's a curve here? Where are they, where are they gonna be blocked? And I think whenever things are too easy for too long, that is where I stop my fiction clients and saying, hey, okay, this 50 pages was so easy and smooth, too easy too smooth. What obstacles can you give your character? Because obstacles are what define characters, just like people, the choices we make define us. And we're going to get philosophical here for a moment. Yes, please. Characters too. We need to think about our choices and who they make us. And we need to have our characters think the same way because that is how they show. They don't tell. You want to tell someone is good, someone is happy, someone is sad, someone is a good person, someone is evil these terms don't work. You need to show your reader who someone is and it's how they react to things and the actions they take that really define those characters. Yeah, good. One of the other things that I wondered about as I was reading about some structure and thinking about agency and plot was just pacing. And like, to me, that seems like one of those big picture kind of questions you would be asking, is the pacing of the story working? How do you, how do you think about pacing? I, I sometimes find myself, will this happen, then this happen, then this happen, then this happen? Boring, but right. what, are your, what are your tips for us around identifying pacing that's bogging down? Absolutely. Well, there's so many little writing tricks to pacing. So when you're thinking about a scene with very high action um, and you can think about, okay, you want your reader to be really turning the pages, the eyes moving really fast across the page in this moment. And then you know there are other moments where you give your reader a little bit of a rep reprieve where you can slow down a little bit and think about just the action and your own heart rate as you're a writer and as you want your reader to react to these things and how you have your heart rate going this is how you can play with your sentence structure, that if you have this high stakes scene, whether it's a sword fight or there's a bomb or the person she's in love with is walking away, whatever that high stakes scene is for whatever the story is that you're writing, in that moment, if you suddenly realize that your sentences, and I'm just using the suddenly realize, which I tell you in my book that you should never say, so ignore that. Um, <laughs> But if in those moments you suddenly take your sentences to this really short staccato point of he ran, she turned, they pursued, and you have this moment to really tighten up your sentences and get them really short, sweet, staccato, not every single one, but if a lot of them go super short, that's just making it easier for your reader's eyes and brain to work that they are so pulled into this action, you're letting them go really fast in this moment. After this moment has passed, after the fight has been won or lost, ever someone sitting on the sidelines, after the big game, whatever that relief moment is, this is the moment to have a sentence that is a little bit more long and kind of wending its way across the page. Obviously, we don't want to go full throw and have a sentence for the entire length of your page and not multiple sentences to a point where you're distracting your reader because they are so lost in your punctuation. But slowing down those moments where you want your reader's heartbeat to settle a little bit, your sentence structure is a great little technique to help them on the way to get your story to go faster or slower. Oh, that is a great tip because I was... I was getting, when you started talking, I was getting confused because I was thinking about 
John Gardner's advice about psychic distance. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how he describes slowing down the important scenes and speeding up the things where you're just trying to toss out information more quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, like the like panning the landscape in a movie versus the close up on the two right. main characters. Right. But you're, what you're describing is actually the craft of the words and being able to tighten up your sentences yeah. to keep the pace going. Yeah. But you're still giving all the detail in the fight scene. Exactly. You're just That's doing it in shorter bites so it moves faster. Exactly. Yes. That's not Got to say it. that the the fight scene should be a shorter scene. Maybe that scene should be way longer. And obviously you can't do all staccato there because then that's hard to read. But if you play with a little bit, maybe your little breather on the sidelines is a shorter scene. Maybe that's only a half page after this big moment for everyone, including your reader to catch your breath. But just the simple length of your sentences within those moments could really have a way for you as a writer to play on the psychology and just cognitive ability of your reader, which is fun. Writers nice. have many tricks. <laughs> oh, I like that one. <laughs> I have to think about that one some more. Uh, what other, what other big, any other big picture questions that you like to look at in the story before you move on to hmm. the next level of editing? So my big ones are kind of what are the motivations for your story to start? Where is the narrative drive? Does a character have agency? Um, is your pacing in line with your intentions? That's kind of what we've been talking about um, in terms of just kind of the, the speed of the scenes a little bit. Um, perhaps I'm missing a big one. Um, perhaps maybe even the entry point of the story. That's probably a big one that I like to talk about in terms of big picture. Just because a writer wrote a scene as the first scene that they write does not necessarily mean that this is the scene that should forevermore be chapter one of your story. And this is something as an editor I see all of the time. Yeah. The <laughs> earlier writers are working on something and there's little pieces of brilliance in there. And maybe it's long description, maybe it's a whole lot of background. I like to consider a lot of that just a writer's warm up. Sometimes a writer needs to write a whole bunch before they can find their story, before they can find their characters, before they tell themselves everything that they need to know before they start that story. But oftentimes, I mean, I've worked with clients where I've just said, okay, that whole chapter needs to go. I've worked with clients for maybe a hundred pages, which is really hard to hear. I've worked with clients before where I said, I, this, there's so much wealth here. Keep this because I think pieces of this are brilliant. Pieces of this can be inserted in other places. But you don't want to just start off, here's all the background for the fast 10 generations of this character's family. That's not your starting point. You don't want to necessarily describe all the aspects of the world that they are living in. Now, if you can intertwine little tidbits into that quest, into that character who's starting to pull you in, awesome. But don't just dump a whole lot of information or have just meaningless scenes that don't really have anything to do with the drive of your entire story up there. You have to think hard about where to begin. And honestly, I don't like to have a writer even finalize where they begin until they get to that ending. Because it's not until you know that ending that you can really figure out, oh, okay, how can I bookend this? Because you kind of need to see both pieces for the whole to work. That is so true for nonfiction as well. When you're starting with your introductory chapter, you know, the one that's going to set out the lay of the land, what you're kind of trying to get at, you can't always write that until you have the rest of the book in place. And I love the way you describe bookending. I use those terms also. How can you bookend this chapter with a starting the story, finishing the story, or a you know consistent type of example? Um, yeah, that's a good one. The warming up and then the bookending. And yeah. it's hard when you warm up and you realize you've warmed up for a really long time. Oh, I know. But I never consider those wasted pages. People are like, oh, I have to trash them. No, hold on to those pages. They might come out of this manuscript in this place, but maybe they'll go somewhere else. Maybe they'll sit in a file and pieces of them will be used for another project. Maybe they'll be used in your marketing materials where you have deleted chapters and then you're going to give that to all your yeah. readers who are in love with you. But, but that's part of your ever wasted. And I imagine that's also for fiction, it's also part of your world building. I mean, you can be doing explicit world building, but that could be part of you're developing that world, you're developing that backstory. So it enriches what comes next, yeah. even if it doesn't all fit in there. 
Exactly. Because you may, you're able to make references to it, I think. Exactly. Yeah. And if you have done that work, then the rest of it is easier and you have something to pull from for later moments in your story. So it's never wasted work. No one yeah. should ever feel sad yeah. about deleting even yeah. 100 pages from a book, which you have that moment of terror. But it makes it so much more powerful if you realize that this is the moment that my protagonist actually realizes what he, she wants. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's kind of move on to the next topic a little bit, how to improve your own work. And I want to position this a little bit that several of us have been reading books for the Writer's Digest self-published book contest recently. Mm -hmm. And across quite a variety of categories, I I have found judging books and judging essays that when you read a lot of the same thing, they quickly stratify into higher quality, lower quality. And you might not always know why that is to start, but then you develop a sort of rubric because you start to see these things. And I imagine agents see that and certainly editors, but what are you seeing that sets apart some of the best manuscripts that you see? This is that kind of micro editing piece that we're talking about because we all have our first draft words and I am never ever going to knock any first draft words because the words that you have to use to tell your story are letting, are letting you get those words onto the page. But so often the difference is that revision moment where you're going back and saying, okay, this is what I said, how can I make that better? How can I make that stronger? How can I make it more unique? Because if you're writing something in a way that everyone has read 100 times before, that's not gonna really make you stand out. However, if you're playing with your verb to be and you're getting rid of all of your sentences that began it was and realizing it was is a really sloppy sentence, there were, is a really sloppy sentence. How can I empower just every single sentence that I began those ways? How can I make sure, and this is always a pet peeve, and I'm sure you guys remember me saying this stuff for those of you who uh, I chatted with a couple of years ago, but how can we get rid of the overuse of the word smile? It is the funniest <laughs> little thing. Because if you're reading a whole lot of manuscripts from earlier writers, and I, I am not laughing at this at all. It is a wonderful word for first drafts. I have many of my own first drafts where my characters are smiling maniacally on my pages. But smiling can mean so much. It can show happiness. It can show hope. It can show love. It can show lust. It can show excitement. It just so many things with, that a smile can do. However, if you as a writer have every single one of your characters smiling to show all of these different complex things, it just gets kind of tiresome and you do have these almost maniacal characters who are just smiling at all times. And this is where you as a reader start using these little tricks of kind of the search um, function in your document, use your find, and look up these little things that people overuse and are a little bit weak. So I always tell people to look for it was in their manuscripts, because if you search for it was in your manuscript, you will find every single it was in your manuscript and you can one by one look at those sentences and think, how can I maybe flip it on its head so I have a subject that makes sense, a verb that empowers it and actually drives the story? How can I look up every there are or there were, whatever tense you're using in your story, and use every single one of those as a challenge. I always pose editing as a challenge. It is not this tedious exercise we have to go through. Well, it kind of is, but I'm not gonna frame it that way. It is a challenge <laughs> for you as a writer to improve your work, to do your best. And I put smile on that list and I read, I mean, as Karen said, I'm a freelance fiction editor. I do this with a lot of clients and I see so many smiles in first drafts of manuscripts. And again, there's nothing wrong with a first draft smile, but this is your moment of how can you show all of those emotions beyond a smile. I was reading an article yesterday, I think it was yesterday, online where it was talking about with face masks that everybody's wearing, how can we connect with each other when we cannot smile at somebody who we see from six feet away in a grocery store? How can we show happiness? Because we have a crinkle in our eyes perhaps, but how can we show warmth when you can't see a smile? And I'm sitting here as an editor, like squeeing at this moment saying, yes, yes, how can we think beyond smiles to show our emotions? 
masks kind of put an interesting spin on it in this moment in history. Good point. Good point. The other thing that I know you talked about in your book besides smiles is eyes. <laughs> He looked directly at her. <laughs> there, was, yes. there was a lot of looking and seeing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it's really funny. Again, there's nothing wrong with these things. And when we're having a conversation, we are looking at my Brady Bunch little screen here of everybody. And I like to look at everybody. But when you're having your dialogue and you're breaking up your dialogue with body language, with movement, with action, when you're having all of these other scenes happen, there's a way for characters to connect besides just looking at each other and glancing and seeing and meeting eyes. And if you actually take the time to look at this kind of list of verbs relating to your eyes in your manuscript, you will just be shocked on how often you fall back on your characters connecting with each other's with glances, with winks, with all of these things related to eyes. Nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying delete every single one, but challenge yourself to think beyond it because those are the manuscripts that stand out. Um, I read a whole lot of fiction manuscripts, agents, um, editors of publishing houses, think about how much they read. And do you want to be in that category where you're kind of red flagging yourself accidentally that you're using the same tired phrases that everybody does? Or do you want to show yourself as an edited, polished, elevated writer? And these are the little things that kind of bring you up a couple notches in this competitive landscape. You also talked about other sensory words without um, without using so many words, showing the senses without saying she thought about or she felt like or it's a uh, there's some really good tips in here for getting yeah. those things across in a more effective way. One of you mentioned one of my favorite tools is the search and replace. <laughs> that is one of my favorite tools in Microsoft Word to find. Uh, my pet words, you know, we, we all have them. them. <laughs> really, very key. Key is one of mine. Um, what are the other things that you like to search on? It's a very mechanical thing, but it works. It works so well. Um, and it's really funny. I always have kind of my list of verbs and actually on my website, and I'll refer everybody to this later, I actually have a, a easy download of kind of my list of like 25 words that you should search in your document to uh, just kind of get eleva to elevate your work a little bit. Um, so I have it was, I have um, there were smile turned because we turn to each other a lot. That's one of those little <laughs> things that you don't realize until you read a whole lot of early fiction, how often people gesture, turn, nod, um, smile, wink, which is funny because if you actually think about it, and I'll see who's actually paying attention here, how many in the room or in the virtual space actually wink? Do people actually wink? It's on my website, whoever just said I would love a copy of that list. I'll give you that link. Um, but just think about how many people you know in your life who actually wink. It's a very small number. But do you know how many people wink in early drafts of fiction manuscripts? People wink all the time, especially when you have multiple characters winking. It's just, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, again, it's one of these things that cracks me up. Again, not that I am ever laughing at writers, but it's just if you actually take it literally and think about what we're doing here, this, these are our chances to elevate. And yeah. that is so many. And yeah, in my book, I have a huge list on my website. I have a, a free download of a lot of this stuff. And I love how you talk about also conciseness and eliminating, you know, fluffy words that we were just talking about some of them, the reallys and the varies. I, I find when I'm editing nonfiction, I can usually, I can usually cut 10 to 20% of the words without making any material change in content. And I'm Absolutely. curious, I'm curious if you find that in fiction. Absolutely. And especially with fiction, everyone is sitting here thinking about, okay, well, I need to have a word count between maybe 80 and 95,000 words and, or depending on what genres they're working in. And then you have a writer who hits 100,000 words. And they're starting to get nervous. And then sometimes they keep creeping up and up and they come to me and saying, oh, I have this book. I don't know what I could possibly cut. <laughs> so, let me add it. <laughs> you have this moment where you just look at the kind of simple things where, again, you can look at the how many times a character couldn't help but do something. It's like, look how many words that phrase was and how many times do you use that phrase in your manuscript? 
um, looking at, as you said, I like to call them sensory introductions. So instead of getting to what someone is seeing, like instead of getting to whatever it is that someone is hearing or seeing or smelling or tasting or feeling, you always have that start or often have that start. She saw. Da -da -da -da. He heard. Da -da -da -da. Well, why do you need that she saw? Why do you need that he heard? Just cut those words and just get to the description because if you put the character in front, what is getting our attention? The character. But what do you really want to do? You're trying to make this world of yours more vivid by bringing in all of your five senses, which is always a fabulous idea, but you don't want to distract the reader with all this extra verbiage to get there, right? Yeah. We are coming up close to eight, so I want to make sure I have a chance to ask you about proofing. Yeah. What are your favorite proofreading tools? Favorite proofreading <laughs> tools. Um, okay, so reading out loud is my favorite proofreading tool, and in this really weird 2020 world that we live in, and I won't just say 2020, I'm going to take it back a year so I don't scare people by talking about 2020, in this modern age that we live in, your computer can read your work to you. That is one of my favorite Which things. I know it's so. It weird. is so useful, though. It is because you yeah. read the work aloud, and your ear will so often catch something that a sentence that doesn't work. But that will help you a lot. But what will really catch you is if you have Microsoft Word yeah. read your work to you. And yes, it will not be an audiobook quality production. However, it will read word for word what you wrote. And sometimes you go oh, that's missing something, or that's not coming off how I meant it to, and it's this amazing little trick. Um, for shorter uh, work, I wouldn't recommend this for novel writers, but I'll admit that I have absolutely done this with my own work. When you get to the proofreading, it's great for journalists or anybody who's doing short stories or a shorter form. In that proofreading stage, I like recommending to read your work backward. And before you start thinking that I'm absolutely wild to suggest this idea, I don't mean word for word backward. I mean sentence by sentence backward. So as you're proofreading, you are reading the very last sentence of your story. And you kind of check that for grammar. And then you read the second to last sentence of your story. And then you read your third to last sentence of your story. And what this stops is you're not gonna get so carried away with your own work that you were so attached to that you're gonna fall into reading. Because when we're ever editing our own work, we know our stories, we love them, we hate them. And we get stuck in this moment where we just suddenly, our editor hat comes off, and we just start reading our story. Maybe it happens a couple pages in, maybe it can go further for you if you really have some good editing stamina. There always comes that point. And if you're reading it sentence by sentence backwards, I don't think I've ever met the ability, anyone who has the ability to fall into a rhythm reading in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the other tips that you mentioned that I had not heard before, which I loved, number one, changing your font which yes. I love changing my font. I recommend that all the time. But you also suggested putting your manuscript on a different device so mm -hmm. that you see it differently. Read it on your tablet or your phone. I yeah, thought that was exactly. brilliant. Like, yes, Thank you. you will yeah, see you it differently. Put it as a PDF and put it on your tablet or whatever, absolutely. And also just a matter of giving yourself a break and realizing just what your attention span happens to be. That I like to always give everybody maybe a, 10, 20 page limit or a 10, 20 minute limit of just have a little timer sitting there because you're being meticulous, you're really paying attention, but if you're going past 20 minutes on your own edits, there's gonna be that moment you're gonna fall into reading your own story. You're not gonna be as meticulous as you were at the very beginning. And after that timer, you don't have to take a giant break. You just need to kind of stand up, touch your toes, go get a sip of water, and then sit back down and get back to it. But just your brain needs breaks because meticulous editing yeah. is hard. So Chris, when, when is it time to bring in another editor? And everybody, we're gonna move into Q&A after this question, I think, so I wanna so start thinking. Um, but when, when do you bring in someone like you to help with editing your novel? So it kind of comes in a couple different places. If you have written your book and you need eyes on it that are not your own, I always like to recommend writing communities and beta readers just out of your circles first, if you have the ability to have those people. I like to say don't you always necessarily use your mother or your children or anyone who is super close to you who will pat you on the back and give you a hug and say great job, because those are important people in our lives, but they aren't going to really help you with editing. Um, maybe your mom is an awesome editor, though, so who knows. 
But so avoid kind of the pat on your back people, the people who will read your book and say, that was really good. Because again, if you're having those friends, that's nice, but it doesn't really help you. If you're at a place where you are in a need of having professional eyes on your work, and maybe you have run through your writing critique group, maybe you don't have a writing critique group, I have kind of different levels that I offer of that kind of first read through where we do that big overarching analysis of what does the story need? Where is it working? Where is it not? Because you need to have somebody's eyes on that. And if you've run out of your own resources, a freelance editor is a great thing for you. And if you have gone through a lot of beta readers, if you feel like those bigger pieces are completely taken care of, and you're getting to a point where maybe you're pitching literary agents, maybe you're pitching small presses or publishers, and you're getting past the queries, but then your first 10 pages or whatever they're looking for, those aren't crossing the line, that's another great place to hire an editor. On the other side of things, if people are thinking about indie publishing, it is so crucial to take the time to do that process well. And I'm such an advocate of calling it indie publishing, not self-publishing, because indie publishing, I feel like an indie publisher builds their creative team. They have cover designers, they have editors, they have formatters, they have all of the pieces just like a professional, traditional New York style publisher. Self-publishing sounds like you're just spitting something out all by yourself, which might not be the greatest quality. But indie publishing, you need to take your time to do it well, and professional editors are an essential, essential piece, not just for the proofreading, but for earlier stages, those story editors, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. I, I noticed in uh, pretty much every book I read in the self-publishing contest that most of them needed another proofread. <laughs> and that's why the stigma is there and it's getting better because yeah. a lot of people are doing a really amazing job with indie publishing. But There's some awesome stuff out there. Mm -hmm. There is, but there's still a lot of stuff out there who could use a better cover, who could use some editing, formatting. There's so many pieces that need to be polished yeah. if you want to be taken seriously in that world and make sales, which is always yeah. good. Yeah, never hurts. <laughs> Let's see if we've got some questions from the group. We had one from Drew and I see Don's finger raised. So Drew first and then Don. Drew, you wanna unmute? Sure, uh, you were talking about bumps in the road to get to a happy ending. Uh, what about novels that don't have a happy ending? Oh, that's a fabulous question. And I was actually just having a conversation with a client today about the necessity of happy endings because you do not by any means need a happy ending. I mean, if you sit through any high school or college lit class, you will never find a happy ending in any of those books. But you still, whatever the conclusion is, whatever the, uh, however your hero completes his journey, whether it is for the better, for the worse, you need to have moments that build the complexity of it, that make it harder, that make it easier. You need to have those ups and downs because a smooth story, smooth sailing is not an adventure story you wanna read. But something where the reader will have their heart into the story and be excited and be connected, those are where you have those moments through the ups and downs. And even if there's not a happy ending, and I'm, I really am happy that you said that because you're right, books don't need happy endings. But no matter what the ending happens to be, you need to have the complexities. You need to have your protagonist make a bad choice. At some point, you need to have them make a bad choice. It's a good idea. Um, and have them stumble. Um, maybe they fall down and break a leg. I mean, whatever it is, you need to actually put some trials and tribulations in front of your protagonist because this is who shows how they show your reader who they are and how you get to that satisfying ending. It's not nearly as satisfying, no matter what your ending is, if there's, they don't have to work for it. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure. Don, would you like uh, to unmute? I did, am, I, am I, I think I'm unmuted. Um, Chris, this has been wonderfully, wonderfully inspirational and, and just informative. And I wanna thank you again for joining us this evening. I wanted to ask you what questions you would suggest we ask when we're at the part of our bright fiction project, where we're ready to bring in an editor such as yourself. Um, say perhaps we're approaching two or three individuals. What questions should we ask to make sure that they are appropriate for our kind of project and also someone that we can work with personally? Good, I'm, another good question. I'm glad you guys are asking. So when it comes to editors, you need to make 
find the right fit. It's just like a marriage. I'm sure Karin will talk about all the partnerships and best friends she has made through her editing process because it is a partnership, a marriage in a way where you are working really hard with this person and you do need to make sure that it is a right fit. There are a couple different things you need to double check on. Genre. You need to make sure whoever it is you're working with is an expert in the genre that you are happen to write. For example, um, I do a lot of mystery and thrillers and women's fiction and romance. I'm kind of in this certain space. I do a lot of literary fiction, book club fiction in this space. However, I do not read enough fantasy or science fiction to ever pick up that editing project because I don't know the conventions of that genre. I don't know the tropes. I don't know the cliches. You need to make sure that you have an editor who is an expert in the specific space where you want to be and is a thorough reader of that. Because one of the things I talk about with every single one of my clients is I always give them a reading list. That after we're done with a big edit, I always say, okay, here are three books that are kind of similar to what you're trying to achieve. And let's look at how these three authors achieve that. And if your editor is not at all familiar in the space, that's not a good thing. So make sure they do the genre. Make sure they are tackling the level of editing that you actually need. Um, if you're calling someone and looking for proofreading and they happen to be a story editor or a development editor, editor it's not the right fit. So you need to make sure that you are on pace for what you're looking for in edit and that this editor does what they are looking for. Um, I would look always to make sure you find some recommendations for this person, find some legit recommendations to make sure this is a valid person that you touch base with or at least find quotes from someone who has used this person before so they can speak to the quality of their work. Um, there are a lot of people out in the world today who realize there's a need for editors and there are a lot of people who will put some really small prices out there just to get the work and it's a waste of people's money and it's very sad um, when people go for the budget option that um, maybe looks really appealing but might not actually help you at all. And also um, samples of your work. Um, having even just a two page sample edit, I just did this for someone earlier this week where they were really stuck and they didn't know whether they wanted to work with me with a manuscript critique or if they wanted to go with a substantive edit, which is kind of a line between the developmental and the copy edit where you just kind of want a little bit of big picture work, but you're mostly working on the micro editing. And so I said, you know what, let's do this side by side. So I did kind of a two page edit of her first two pages of her book in these two different styles so she could see the difference, so she could see how I worked. And I knew she gave a sample edit to another clients um, or another editor who was doing the same thing for her so she could see my work and her work side to side um, and that worked out well so that way she's kind of getting to see personalities but yeah you need to do some digging you need to talk about timing you need to talk about pricing you need to talk about like all of those contracts deposits all the business end of things which are not sexy but they have to be done <laughs> I also need to ask you and I hope it's not personal what's the artwork next to your novel editing book behind you on your second shelf Oh, sure. <laughs> From my perspective, it looks like a New Yorker cartoon, but I'm probably wrong. Oh, I'm way wrong. This is Alice in Wonderland, and it says, we're all mad here, <laughs> which is just kind of something that speaks to my creative space. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's wonderful advice on how to find an appropriate editor, Chris. Thank you very much for that. Absolutely done. Well, let me just echo that too, that you need to make sure you understand what type of editing you're looking for. I just recently had an edit, a client who had had an editor insist that he needed copy editing. And I saw his manuscript and I'm like, we need to do a critique first because you got some big picture issues to deal with. So that, you know, yeah, understand what stage you're at. Right. And that's a hard thing sometimes when you're convinced you've put in time and effort and years into a project and then to have that conversation. But you need to be open with it. Editors are not out to get you. <laughs> We're here to yeah. help. That's the whole purpose of us. Rita, did we question questions? I don't see any hands. Oh, I think Patrick's got one. Okay. Unmute. Hi. Uh, first off, thank you. Uh, Chris and uh, Karen for coming. Uh, one, you guys have a wonderful chemistry. I really enjoying uh, this the conversation. Um, I'm, you know, I'm actually at the point of trying to find an editor, etc. And so this is all like a big, it's like a big black hole. I mean, I took all the creative light writing classes and all these things, story structure, the three act play versus the four act play, blah blah blah. 
editing, however, in college. Never taught. They never talked about it. They never taught it. It was just a mystery. So I can honestly say I've learned more in the last 45 minutes, you know, than I did in five years of college, uh, at least as regard to editing. Uh, is it, you know, the idea that it, there's such a difference between uh, someone that's effectively a proofreader versus somebody that's kind of like a life coach for your book, you know, that's a revelation to me. Um, I'm curious, are there any credentials I should be looking for or just go for the reviews? Um, you can definitely look for the credentials in car and I'm actually really interested in your answer to this one also. Um, I am kind of a homegrown editor. I, while, I mean, I have my master's degree and I used to teach college writing classes, so I guess those are my credentials, but there are a lot of editing associations and editing, um, proofreading multiple different style of editor credentials out there that definitely will be uh, something to show you that someone is legit. Because again, it's a matter of legitimacy and how you can make sure whoever it is that you end up working with is really the real deal. I'm not just going to say that they're helping your work, but not really do the work for you to elevate your project. Um, Karin, what do you think? Yeah, you know, that's a, oops, that's a great question. Um, getting some feedback. Uh. I, I don't have any formal editing or proofreading credentials either. I learned on the job. I spent a lot of time in the corporate world writing technical documents. And the thing that that got me to do was to write with extreme clarity. And when I left one of my jobs, my going away present was a package of red pens because people... <laughs> were used to me writing all over their documents that needed more clarity. So for me, I tend to look at more big picture type of editing. I'm pretty good at the little stuff too, but I like the big stuff. I've worked with a couple people in this group who do have some editing and proofreading credentials. Uh, I, don't know, I don't think Jenny's here, but Jenny Hart does. And Rita, I can't remember if you have a credential. It seems like there's a couple other people um, that is no credentials, 30 years of experience, but no credentials. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's not something I actually have ever really looked for or sought out, but well, probably wouldn't I, hurt. Well, maybe the other way to go is, uh, you know, something a little more empirical. Uh, you know, what books have you worked on? Mm -hmm. You know, right. is it a, is yeah. it common that if you've edited a book, you know, that your name's going to be attached to it in some way. It's not going to be like, oh, I, you know, I ghost edited this or something. I don't think that ever happens, does it? Um, yeah, my name's definitely not attached to everything that I work yeah. on um, with that relationship. Um, in fact, often I am a silent partner in the background of things. However, um, going back to Don's question of how you can double check someone's the right fit for you, um, a lot of editors will have past clients on their website and will have kind of a list of here are past books that are out in the world and that have won these awards that have hit this bestseller list that have done all of that. So, I mean, I know I have that page on my website where I talk about my most exciting um, editing hits of the past couple years where this just won this award and all this stuff and I get to cheer on my clients a little bit and kind of show I'm legit. This is what I've been working on. I, I noticed that. I mean, I've already been to your website when I heard you were speaking. Uh, that's why I was curious. Is that kind of a common thing that I possibly can come across? I mean, it, it seems, that seems like a pretty good way to find it. I'm, I'm looking for any way that you can tell that person, as you said, you know, is, is going to be someone who's not going to just, you know, send me down the wrong path and, you know, happily cash my checks. Right, right. That sample edit is huge. Testimonials in whatever form that happens to take, whether it's on their website or you can even just ask them, hey, do you have, who have you worked with? And you can ask them that question because um, people are pretty accessible these days, especially when it comes to client work. All right. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Don, did you have one more question? I saw your, saw your hand up there. You look like you're muted there. <laughs> Am I unmuted now? There you are. Um, uh, uh, one last question real quick, Chris. There was a fascinating article today in Esquire.com about fact checking, um, particularly nonfiction books. I forwarded it to TAF. I was curious as to whether you were ever called upon for that aspect of editing as well as the other stuff that you do. Um, and if someone needs fact checking for either a magazine article 
less likely, but more likely for a book length project. What advice would you offer those individuals? Another good question. I am not that person. Uh, that's not something I do. Um, oftentimes, because I deal 99% um, with fiction. Um, so my big fact checking is really a matter of subject matter experts that saying after I get through all of this, you know what, you had this scene set in Jamaica and all of this stuff. Um, why don't you have someone who really knows Jamaica read this to make sure it's legit. So whether it's subject matter, historical time period, um, sensitivity or authentic, authentic, authenticity readers, it's getting to be late here, folks, sorry. Um, but just making sure that you might need to have that extra pair of eyes. If you're writing someone of a culture or background that is vastly different from your own, you need to have that person. I'm not that person. I don't necessarily know how you would find that person. I find universities are honestly my best resource that I have ever used in terms of a lot of things um, looking for. Um, I've had graduate students in certain departments of universities do fact checking for me and sensitivity work for me and um, um, the specialist type things that only someone who happens to be majoring in 18th century Baroque, I, I'm throwing words that I don't actually know what they mean, so who knows, but finding a specialist in that area, you can find them and universities are a great source. Thank you. Great point. Chris, if you're up for it, I have one last speed round of questions for you oh, before we wrap up. <laughs> Ready? Game, yes. All right. Yeah, in a I'm minute really or nervous. less. I'm really the nervous. Minute. You're going to stump me on something grammar-wise because I literally. No, ah, no, 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 no. These are fun questions. All right. <laughs> Favorite color of pen for editing. Oh, these are fun questions. Boy. Yeah. Overused pet word that you always have to search and delete. Couldn't help but it's a phrase, but it'll count. It's <laughs> the current book on your nightstand. Ooh, the muralist. The Muralist? Muralist, the same author as The Art Thief. Oh, interesting. Favorite author? Oh, that one changes by the day. Um, I'm going to go with... Ooh, I'm going to go... Speed with, round. Speed oh, round. Me, Dan Patchett. <laughs> All right. Besides your own, a book about writing that you regularly recommend. I regularly recommend. Um, let's see. The most, and I'm going to cheat on this question, but it's speed round, so I think I'm allowed. What I always tell people that before anything else, if they want to learn how to write, they have to read. They have to go and read their genre heavily. Um, Stephen King's fun. I, I love Stephen King's um, elements of style. Wait, no, excuse me. No. On writing. On writing. Thank on you. writing. Yes. All right. Favorite location for writing. Hmm. Actually, at my desk, I just feng shui'd my office, so I'm feeling some really happy vibes. <laughs> nice, nice. And finally, what is the next book that you are writing? Fun question. My next book comes out in November. It is actually called The Family Story Workbook, and it is really designed for this moment in history more than anything else for people who have always wanted to write their life story but have never known where to start, to people who have always wanted to capture their family stories before those stories are lost, for people who are looking to connect with family members who they might not be able to physically see in this moment, but you could have a really awesome interview over the phone or over video conferencing. And it is a workbook for really building your family story. And I am so excited about it. It's coming out in November. Awesome. So I imagine if people are interested, they could probably get on your email list so that they know yeah when it's coming out and i will just remind everybody that chris's novel writing yeah. novel editing workbook is out great resource if you're a fiction writer thank handy you. dandy reminders chris thanks so much for absolutely. being here tonight this was so much fun absolutely I'm happy to see my, you you too i'm just putting my website in the chat room so if anybody's interested in any of my, learning more about any of my books i have a monthly newsletter that comes out that is packed with writing tips and podcasts and all sorts of stuff. So I would love to stay connected with everybody on my newsletter. Um, and really, Karin, Don, Rita, everyone, thank you so much for having me. You guys are wonderful. It's just a pleasure. Thanks for I'll coming. Turn it back over to Rita and, and Don. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Don, I'll flip it to you in just a second. Uh, so Chris put her website in the chat and Karin's is clearsightbooks.com. So I will stop recording but the Zoom will stay open until 8.30. Don, would you like to say something? 
Well, again, Chris, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This was absolutely wonderful. Um, I think you've really inspired everybody in this group to edit better and more thoroughly. And I think our works are gonna be improved because of that. And I hope that you'll join us again down the road, especially when your new book comes out. We would love to talk with you about that when that happens. Absolutely, thank you so awesome. much.